Live in the CNN newsroom, I'm Ana Cabrera in New York. We begin with news of a profound loss today, a loss felt deeply here at CNN. Broadcasting legend and icon Larry King, member of our CNN family, has passed away at age 87. He hosted the popular CNN show Larry King Live for more than 25 years, interviewing major newsmakers, celebrities, presidents, athletes, and so many more people. King left CNN in 2011 after taping more than 6,000 episodes of his show, but he kept working until his death, hosting Larry King Now. King's family hasn't yet revealed his cause of death, but we know King was hospitalized with COVID-19 in late December. He was known for his easygoing demeanor, his trademark suspenders, of course. CNN's Anderson Cooper takes a look at King's amazing life and broadcasting career. More than 50,000 interviews, an infinite amount of what, where, when, and why. Why? 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 The secret of my ability was uh, stupid. In other words, I didn't know, and I readily confessed I didn't know, and I would say, help me, to the guest. Help me, I don't know. What, why? why? Why did you do that? Why do you have one name? As opposed to what? Two names. I got a, you know, Madonna. Ciccone. Leibowitz. That's good, that's good, <laughs> I like that. I was asking around to a couple of people who have been on your show about what it is that makes it work so well, and they said that you make guests comfortable to the point where they feel they can say anything. You know the secret. I want the guest to be good, I want them to be responsive, I want them to react, and I'm gonna be there tomorrow night. A lot of good memories. And then look at me now. <laughs> I look back on my life, and I sometimes think I'm looking at someone else. I look at the things that have happened to me, the good and the bad, and I can't believe it sometimes. I mean, I can't believe it. I look at my, my teenage boys. Who is that me? Come on. Somebody's kidding. Somebody's kidding. It's uh, all a world. It's a, uh, I'm still doing it. What a humble man. Legendary comedian Billy Crystal is joining us live in just a moment. Here's a clip of Crystal and Larry together on the show. Watch this. Billy, hi. Hi. I'm, I've been a fan of yours since the 70s. I think you're marvelous and you are brilliant. Oh. I'd like to know, how do you keep coming up with this wildly brilliant and hysterical material after all this time? Well, um, yeah, because material, it's a fair question, it's hard to explain, but material in a medium like this one or movies where you're on, when you do as much as you do, usually eats itself up. I tell you, I'm, um, if this was baseball, I'd say I'm on a hitting streak. I don't, you know, I, I don't know where things come from sometimes. I was once, like the idea for City Slickers, I was watching um, a television show about uh, fantasy vacations, you know, and there was scuba diving you could do and go down a raft, uh, the Colorado River, and I have a pad pretty much in every room and just in case I get some of these little epiphanies and I, I wrote City Slickers at the top of the page. Really? Those two words? Yeah, I wrote the title. I wrote three friends go on a cattle drive. Uh, friends, just pretty much how I described the story. I even wrote Jack Palance's name in the in like half a page of legal pa uh, legal pad. That is unexplainable. And then it, then it just comes. Billy Crystal is joining us now on the phone. Billy, it's so great to have you be part of this conversation as we remember the life of Larry King and his legacy. You've been interviewed by the great Larry King, but I know you also knew him off the air as well. When you think of him, what goes through your mind? I think of, uh, of Larry um, as really sort of like a relative. He sounded like a relative. He was funny. He was charming. He was very smart. Um, and he was a regular guy. We could talk about politics. We could talk about comedy. We could talk about bagels. We could talk about anything. And <clears throat> I think that Larry's passing is, is um, he's part of a senior class, Anna, of really enduring legends that we've been losing steadily. I mean, Hank Aaron, just the other day, and my very dear friend, Carl Reiner, and Regis Philbin, and Kirk Douglas, really giants who who sustained themselves into their 90s. Um, and so it's a, you know, it's a sad day, but what an amazing career in that, you know, he was, 
he was on CNN for 25 years. But the, the reason you can do that is because people trusted him. Mm-hmm. And, and you wanted to be interviewed for I remember the first time I was interviewed with him, um, I, I really felt like I had arrived. I mean, I, I was starting to do movies and you started to do press tours, you know. And then they said, Larry King wants to talk to you. And I was like, oh. And I was actually quite nervous because... It was just Larry at the desk, no audience, so that was a little bit of an away game for me. <laughs> and it was just a conversation that he actually made me relaxed because he was he was just so prepared, no notes. He just talked. And I, I think he was also very aware, and you'll know this too as a, as a broadcaster, uh, the timing of the segment that you have. So the next question was, was right there. He didn't have to think about anything. And... Um, that kept me on my toes and uh, made me respect him even more. He always was ready. Yeah, I think all of us in this business have so much respect for, as you point out, his quick ability to come up with a question without notes. If you saw my desk, I have a ton of pages in front of me. I, I always come prepared, I think. But he had this ability to just listen so intently and ask the question that popped into his head, perhaps, um, because he was so innately curious. I, I want to take another look at a clip of you on Larry's show, and then we'll talk on the other side. Okay. You got to be you got to be happy with the way the basketball scenes turned out. I, I mean, yeah. Well, you know, the guys are so great. And we have Charles Barkley and, and David Robinson, the MVP, and Kareem and Isaiah, Bill Lambeer, Chris Mullen, Reggie Miller. And, and I think it's the best work that Reggie Miller's ever done. It, it is. And, and, by the way, I heard today from John Feinstein that you, uh, Reggie Miller took two days off camp to shoot that and, and that Larry Brown was ticked. Well, he should have been. I only needed Reggie for half an hour. The other two, <laughs> the other two days, uh, I don't know where he was. <laughs> I don't know where he was. Cato doesn't know where he was. <laughs> we, we just have no idea where he was. Billy, you said he could talk about anything. I know you're a big New York Yankees baseball fan. Tell me about Larry King, the sports fan. Well, uh, Larry was a you know diehard Dodger fan. If anyone who watched any of the playoff games of the World Series of recent years, he'd be you know in the front row uh, with his Dodger jacket and so on. So uh, I actually got to play in an old timers game. I was uh, you know I had one major league at bat with the Yankees back in 2008 as a, a great favor from George Steinbrenner. So I had some street cred as a Yankee. So the Yankees were uh, playing, and uh, they had old-time Yankees here at Dodger Stadium. So they asked me to play to fill out the teams, and they were playing against the old-time Dodger teams, which were the great Steve Garvey, Ron Say, that, that group. So I'm at bat, and Larry King is the umpire. And I'm, I'm facing the immortal Fernando Valenzuela. And the first pitch is two feet away. I mean, it's high and two feet out of the strike zone. Larry says, strike one. So I turned and said, Larry, what? And the next pitch, same place, strike two. So I stepped out and said, Larry, those weren't even close. And he says, <laughs> I know, but I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that says so much about his personality, right? Um, and, you know, he was, a, he, he was so... He was so fluent in so many things. You know, uh, yeah. two years ago, Larry was kind enough to host an event in my honor at the Friars Club. It, it was uh, a big fundraising event for the club. And he was the MC. And Anna, he was, and I've been with other events where he's spoken. And he, you know, because he was around comedians who he adored um, and other show business people his entire life, it's felt like that he picked up their rhythms. And he was able to perform really like a like a Borscht Belt comic in the best way. He had great timing um, and great rhythm, and he, it was um, it was really a lesson in uh, in being prepared. Again, you know, he didn't work from any notes or anything, just like he did when he was being interviewed. And he had a, you know about a thousand people to talk to, and um, he was uh, he was a stunning human being. No doubt about it. You talk about his, his quick wit and the fact that you said he could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with other comedians, even though that wasn't his day job. Did, was it fun to go on his show as a comedian because he kind of would set you up to deliver the punch? Well, yeah. I, well, he also was a little intimidating because you didn't know where he was going to go. 
and you didn't know what his his um, approach would be. You know, you're coming on basically to talk about the latest project and so on and so forth. And and he might have wanted to talk about something else. So again, without an audience, it was almost like going into a you know a shrink session or something because. Uh, there he was, you know, with the big glasses and and the and, and the uh, and just the way that he would sit there and look at you and and um, and he he never looked at notes and just it just kept coming. So it was always a pleasure to be with him, but there was a little fear involved at times uh, because again he uh, he just you didn't know where he was going to go, but it always ended up in the right in the right place. You know, his show was destination programming and and today we have so many different information outlets and media outlets and places to get information and entertainment you know with our smartphones and the internet do you think that you know his his legacy is tied to an era where people wanted to to be at home listening and he was just such a great great conversationalist uh, I do and I also think that it was of a different time um, that, and I'm, I may be wrong, of course, but I don't remember a lot of the phone calls that he would take, which um, were a big part of the show, uh, with anyone calling with much animus, uh, anger. There seemed in the country seemed to be a lot less during that time, um, and of course, depending on who the guest was, but he would he would treat whoever called in with great dignity, and you felt like you were calling in. You know, to a friend. I I also used to kid him. You talk about social media a little bit. Uh, that his column, he had a newspaper column um, that was sort of, in a way, a precursor of tweeting, because he would write these w little one one sentence observations and tie them all together. Uh, and and I used to kid him. I said, Larry, how is how is this a column? How is it? To, and he'd write tomato soup and grilled cheese. Still a great lunch on a snowy day. <laughs> and I'd say, that's that's writing. And it, he just would laugh big. You know, in my mind, Tony Bennett is still the greatest singer. And that was his entire column. <laughs> so, he, you know, it's, um, I'm sure know. He, I'm sure he got a lot of opinions, though. I'm sure it sparked a lot of passion in people. <laughs> Some he of those. He did. He did. And people wanted to talk to him. You know, sometimes I'd see him and I wouldn't even say hi, Larry. I'd just go, Altoona, you're on. And and he just would giggle. And then, um, you know, he was uh, he was a real, I'll use the word Hamish, guy. Mm. And um, and I, I again, and like Regis and Carl Reiner, to have a career that long mm -hmm. and be that good for that long is something um, we all should be grateful for and aspire to. I think it says that he was just so passionate. He lived and breathed the work that he did. It was, in some ways, I, I imagine, effortless for him, the fact that he wanted to work all the way up to his death because he loved it so much. Billy Crystal, thank you very much for sharing your memories and your thoughts and your perspective on the life and legacy of Larry King. Thank you. Next hour, we'll talk with your co-star and analyze this, Robert De Niro, about his memories about Larry King. He's going to join us live at the top of 5 o'clock. And as we go to break, a look back. At that time, Larry King got the President of the United States to show him his driver's license. When was the last time you drove? <laughs> I, I, I drive when I'm, uh, have, we have, I have my own truck, for example. Oh, Maine. so you do drive. You yeah, drive, drive. got a car in Washington, but I don't drive it very much. I'll, <laughs> I'll drive around the circle in the, uh, in the Oval Office, Oval, Oval in front of the White House. Would you, but you, can drive, you can drive when I go hunting, something like that. Yeah, I go hunting every year here in Texas, and I drive a truck. And it's still a Texas driver's license. It's still. You want to see it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me see. i got to be sure I got... Let's make sure it isn't expired. Sure the right. No, no, it's not expired. <laughs> Hannah, I like that smile. <laughs> Did you say president? Yeah. Wait a minute. Yep. President George W. Bush. The White House, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Department of Public Safety, Texas. It's a Class C driver's license. Hey, wait a minute. Six feet, one inches uh, tall. Sex is male. 
<laughs> Isa Brown, birth date 6-12-24, and this expires 6-12-93. I'm legal. See, where's your car? Let's go for a drive. <laughs>